because as I went throughout my career, it just occurred to me, boy, I didn't hear about this. I didn't hear about that. Often in the areas of just how to listen to people, how to have some kind of um, emotional grounding in what you're doing, how to listen to your inner voice. What's the true meaning of hard work? None of these things were ever talked about in law school. Hey, everyone, and welcome. I am Morgan Gis McDonald, founder, CEO of Paper Raven Books. And I have with us today a very special guest who is launching a brand new book called Rewiring the White Collar Mind, Transcending Professional Training to Achieve True Life Balance and Contentment. So if you are one of those folks who is constantly struggling with, I am ambitious in my career and I want to do great things and... I actually want to enjoy this life as well. Um, how do we do those things? This is going to be a fantastic conversation for you. And the person who is authoring this book and here to speak to us definitely knows a thing or two about an ambitious career. Uh, he is a civil litigator and mediator with the law firm Dickinson Wright. He's been an attorney for over 40 years, has an incredible number of credentials, including Best Lawyers in America, Who's Who in American Law, List of top five at Arizona lawyers and um, has taught at the WP Carey School of Business at Arizona State and has been called by Mr. Martin Lotz, the master information gatherer, a very effective negotiator, one of the best lawyers I know. I am super excited to introduce to you guys author Charles Price. Charles, thanks for being here. Thanks, Morgan. It's great to be here. Well, I am personally very uh, glad, grateful that you have brought this book out to us um, all about sort of rewiring the white collar mind. I didn't prep you with this, but I'm married to an attorney. <laughs> and so I am uh, just personally invested in this conversation in a lot of ways and grateful to be able to bring this conversation to, to our audience as well. Can you tell us a little bit about this book? What's it about? Who did you write it for? Absolutely. So my original conception for the book was that it would be written for attorneys because that's probably the world that I know best. And indeed, some of the seeds for the book were sown when I was giving lectures to um, law students at Arizona State University. And I was talking to them basically about all the things you don't learn in law school. Because as I went throughout my career, it just occurred to me, boy, I didn't hear about this. I didn't hear about that often in the areas of just how to listen to people, how to have some kind of um, emotional grounding in what you're doing, how to listen to your inner voice, what's the true meaning of hard work. None of these things were ever talked about in law school. And when I talked to law students, I would point out to them all the things that they weren't learning. I would say, look at your curriculum. You are learning to study precedent, which is looking backward, and you're learning to strategize, which is looking forward, but you're never taught to live right now. And yet you know that everyone's life is a summation of all of their individual present moments, if you will. And so you can see just in what I've told you in the last two minutes, that you are learning something that may very well lead you to be professionally successful, but possibly personally miserable. Okay, so I'm talking to law students, I'm talking about what it takes to be a lawyer and all that stuff. And then I really realized there's a much broader conversation here. It's not as if lawyers are taught in this strange way, but architects and engineers and doctors and everybody else has this wonderful sort of, you know, present mindedness and mindfulness and lives in the present moment. It's all professionals. And, and it's not just that that they're not getting what they need to live a truly balanced life. As I point out in the book, particularly chapters six through 16, we get pernicious messages that are the opposite of what we need to learn and to know and to practice in order to have a truly healthy, balanced life. And to my knowledge, this is the only book that talks about how our professional training literally trains us away from the things that we all know instinctively that we need to have a contended, balanced life. But it it's very successful in teaching us away from those things because number one, it's a system that has been built up over many decades, if not centuries. It speaks to us in very strong terms, often with things like compensation and professional rewards and 
esteem of your colleagues and so on. And so we have to understand the limitations of that so that we can truly seize control of our own lives and live the kind of lives that we wanted to when we first chose our profession. Yes. I mean, absolutely. This is one of those conversations that uh, I feel like people will talk about, but you have actually brought so many of these threads of the conversation, grounded them into one book, and really also bringing to the table that, yes, you can be ambitious in your career. <laughs> you know, you really can want to be um, the best of the best in your field and have a fulfilling life. And I'm curious, Charles, I mean, you mentioned sort of chapters six through 16, which is the section of the book that's called, you know, fooling some of the people some of the time. And you kind of go through these different um, myths, I guess, or mistakes. And one of the chapters that caught my attention was control, the illusion and the reality. What are some of the the illusions or or myths or things that, that you feel like are common or ubiquitous in this professional training that you come across? Yeah, so there are lessons that are common and ubiquitous, and they're all the more powerful for being sort of unconscious and unspoken. Nobody ever comes out and tells you in law school or thereafter, you can be in total control of everything. But that's the implicit message. Certainly nobody says, hey, mistakes happen. It's okay if you have a 500 batting average, you're better than most professional ball players, any professional ball player over time. Uh, so, but they never say that. Uh, and there's this, um, you see lawyers suffering over losses and mistakes and, and just the general disappointments and challenges that arise in everyone's life, but almost no one says, that's just the way it is, that's part of a professional life, it's part of a human life, you know that at some level, let's pick ourselves up and move on. You just never get that message. So what I say in the book is you really need to take the responsibility of giving yourself that message and understand you're probably not going to get it from your employer, probably not going to get it from your clients. I give a few examples of where I actually have gotten very healthy messages from my clients, but they are valuable because they are so rare. And I've also, I talk about in the book about how much resistance I get to some of these ideas from my professional colleagues and friends. I was talking with a very good friend of mine, super successful lawyer, about some of these ideas many years ago when I was just kind of formulating my, my thoughts. And at one point he said in our conversation, well, we didn't sign up to be happy. And I thought to myself, well, I know I didn't sign up to be miserable. I, I don't remember having that discussion or, or reaching that agreement. So that was just the first of a million signs that we all have to be very mindful and intentional about taking control of this kind of messaging to ourselves, because the contrary messaging that we get from our profession, from our training, from our experience uh, is, is very powerful. Yeah. Well, folks, if you're here and you're watching, you're listening, you're thinking, I wish I'd had someone in my life, you know, start to introduce these ideas to me, maybe a mentor, maybe we would have wanted a mentor and we don't have one currently. This could be the book that introduces you to these grounding, balancing principles about how to be content, you know, even uh, as you're a professional who's pursuing an, an incredible career. So you can check out this book, go to paperravenbooks.com slash rewiring the white collar mind and it's linked next to this video. You can click the link, takes you straight over to Amazon. You can grab a free copy of the ebook right now. The book is launching. We want to get out to as many people as possible. And so uh, we're offering the ebook for free. Of course, you can buy the physical version if you like the physical version as well. Um, but that ebook is free today. Go ahead and load it up, get it on your Kindle, get it ready for the weekend um, and be ready to dive in. So I would encourage you guys to go ahead and grab a copy while you're here, while you're thinking about it. And um, Charles, was there something in your life that sort of brought you to this awareness or these uh, different awarenesses around how to lead this more contented life or even to pursue it, to go for it? <laughs> yeah, I talk about that at some length in the early chapters of the book. In fact, I start off in the book describing a visit that I made when I was in college to a psychiatrist in Santa Barbara and basically kind of what I laid out for him was, 
my life is great. I'm doing well. I'm successful. Everything's fine. I just have this blinding headache all the time. <laughs> so please take away my headache and then everything will be fine. And as you might imagine, he thought it was appropriate to take a little bit of a deeper look, like what's going on in your life. And I explained to him, well, you know, my my parents got divorced and then my stepdad died and then my girlfriend left me. And, you know, so, wow, there's a lot of room for pain there. And I, I told him, kind of consistent with the way emotions were treated in my family. Well, that's just the way it is. You just pick yourself up and move on. So that was an early starting point for me of a totally different way of looking at things, of understanding that I'm not this disembodied intellect, but that I am a combination of my mind, but also my emotions, my connections with others, my everything about me. And it's all got to work together and be more or less acknowledged and respected. Otherwise, things are going to fall off the rails. But sort of started, I would say, at some level with that experience when I was in college. And then, as I described in the book, it was honestly sort of on and off for the next couple of decades. I can't say I got it all figured out in college and then everything was great. I developed a significant drinking problem when I was in my 30s. Uh, and kind of overcame that. And the process of overcoming that and acknowledging it and just sort of embracing it and not being just consumed with shame about that, that also was a, an important step forward in just realizing there's a lot going on with me. Maybe it's a good idea to look inward and figure out what some of this stuff is so I can live a little more at peace with myself. Yeah. Uh, that, well, thank you for sharing um, both in the book and and here. I think it's helpful for people to know that if we have struggled in some way, that we're really not the only ones. And in fact, I mean, most of us do. We struggle with some sort of emotional pain, or you know, maybe we're trying to numb, or or we end up creating some sort of uh, addiction, or even just some unexplained need for whatever it is that helps us get through the day. Right. And that's that's not abnormal, but it doesn't have to be our everyday life. And I think that's one of the real messages of hope that that you bring to us. And, and what are some of the messages, Charles, that you hope that this book really um, lands for anyone who reads it? Well, and just to pick up on your point, and, and then I'll, I'll answer that question. I talk a lot about my daughters in the book and what an inspiration they were to me, because I knew I really wanted to be a good dad. So, okay, that's great. But I knew I just didn't have some of the most basic stuff that I was going to need to be a good dad. I, I realized I needed to become more vulnerable and a better communicator and a lot of other things. Uh, so I talk about them at that level and, and in that context. But my daughter, Kate, in particular, is a, a very strong writer herself. She looked at an early draft of this book and said, well, it's good, dad, but it needs a lot more of you in it. We need to know you're such a good storyteller. Tell us the story of how you came to have these insights. And, you know, tell us kind of the good, bad, and the ugly, rather than just getting up there and kind of laying out a bunch of life lessons for everybody. I thought, well, A, she's right about that. B, um, that's bad news at two levels. Number one, there's going to be a lot of rewriting here, which was, in fact, the case. And number two, I'm going to really have to get vulnerable with this. So I don't just look like some guy who's preaching about this is how you should live your life. And and once you start down that path, there's sort of, there's only one way and that's forward. And I talk about, you know, a lot of things that I've struggled with. I talk about um, my sensitivity. There's a whole chapter on sensitivity. And that may seem unusual for a sort of hard boiled corporate litigator. But uh, as I point out, it is I'm not going to say it's a curse, but it's certainly something that you have to adjust for if you're highly sensitive, but it can be an amazing gift. And I talk about the fact that I generally know in a deposition what the witness is going to say before they say it. As soon as I get to know them a little bit, it's like, all right, I got this. I, I know what they're going to say. And so that's that's great. I'm, I'm a good listener. Um, I'm empathetic with people. And all of that kind of goes in with the sensitivity and makes you realize it's it's all a package. And if you're not wired that way, if you are, I talk about personality types in one of the chapters, 
I would say probably the opposite of the sort of sensitive type like me would be the driver, uh, the sort of type A is what we could sometimes call them. And, you know, the driver generally are very motivated by winning. It's great if they win. It's even better if you lose. Da, 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 da. Okay. Well, and, and if that's how you're wired, that's cool. That's where you are. And you probably can't get to where I am, nor could I get to where you are. But the more we understand it, the more we're able to move in the world of people who are wired differently. How does a driver manage a sensitive person? How does a sensitive person manage or negotiate with a driver? And so I talk about all these things uh, that I've learned over, over the years. But kind of my, my overall approach was I'm just going to let it all hang out in terms of the things that I've struggled with. If people have struggled with the same thing, that's great. And even if they haven't, hopefully they can see, um, I'm not just trying to get up here on a soapbox and preach. I'm trying to tell you, this is what I spent my last three, four decades on. And if you can get that work done in a year or two, cool. I just bought you 30 years. So you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I I imagine this when I'm reading through your book, I feel like you are a mentor in a lot of ways, and and a mentor in the best ways um, that you're willing to share your life with us as the reader, and you're willing to share what you've learned, and it's not from a pulpit, you know, it really is from shared experience and um, and the hard way, right, and just wanting to to save the reader, kind of that. That, that lessons learned the hard way. So that's how it came across to me. And, and, you know, I could, I could put myself back in, as I said, I married an attorney. We've been together since high school, actually. So I went through college and law school with him, knew all his law school buddies. And I could almost imagine sort of that graduate level, young professional level, they, they want a mentor, right? And so um, this is one of those opportunities of like, if you feel like you don't have a mentor who really supports you in living a full life, yes, profession, but also balance, contentment, satisfaction, like this is the book that can start to bring these ideas. And, and I guess, Charles, like if you were to mentor someone and like, okay, this is required reading for <laughs> mentoring with, with Charles Price, like what would you hope? And I'm going to circle back to that question. You know, what are some of the themes that you hope that would really land for the reader? So what are the things that, that let's kind of focus on the things that our, our profession specifically teaches us away from? You mentioned the control issue. Um, there's a chapter on, should I follow my passion? Uh, and, and often people have this notion of, I just need to find the thing that I'm passionate about and then the money will follow. That was kind of a big thing a couple, you know, well, a while ago. Uh, and I, I point out, it's a mistake to think that you're going to find something that is such a perfect match for your skills that there's going to be no disappointments, no heartache, no you know, stress. Uh, so I, th I think that's a little misleading. And so what I kind of come to in the chapter is rather than following your passion, create your passion by being attentive and devoted to your work with all the ups and downs. So I talk about that. I talk about the true meaning of hard work. Um, what this, you know, most of us professionals kind of absorb this idea that hard work is great, uh, more hard work is better. And it's it's this kind of unspoken, uh, in fact, I actually wrote down the syllogism, this is in the book, but I, I talk about a syllogism that we all kind of believe unconsciously, and yet when you say it out loud, it's crazy. To be happy, you must be successful. To be successful, you must work hard. To work is to be miserable. Therefore, to be happy, you must be miserable. That's kind of how that plays out. And in fact, I've seen any number of people who would say, yeah, in the abstract, I want to be happy, but I have this job that's very difficult and stressful. So I guess I'm just going to be miserable. And so I talk about what does it really mean to work hard? What are examples from sports and history and everything of people who have worked hard, but maintained some kind of balance and some kind of perspective? So what's, what is hard work? What does that really mean? I talk about the inner voice. Um, the way we talk to ourselves, the way we interpret things. We need to be very mindful of the interpretations that we put on events. Everybody understands at some level that it's not what happens to you, it's how you react to it. We all kind of know that. But as you dig down into that, what does it really mean to be able to interpret your life in a way that adds to your contentment rather than subtracts from it? 
because we tend to be so hard on ourselves that we destroy any possibility for long-term life balance and contentment. I talk about listening. Very few of us as professionals are taught to listen. And yet a client, and I, I know this from personal experience, they, they love it when you listen attentively and respectfully to what they have to say. Everybody does. Um, and I, I quote a letter, a lovely, wonderful letter from a client who's a good friend of mine about my listening to her. So that's something we're not taught. And it's something that's like a magic pill. If you, if you can learn to listen, you're going to be way ahead of the game just, just from that one chapter. It uh, helps with relationships in general, right? Your oh, work relationships. 100%. As well I, as personal relationships. I mean, if people feel like you are listening to them, you're smoothing out a lot of the friction with other humans. <laughs> I, I raised three daughters through their teenage years, and I would tell fathers of daughters, I said, there's one sentence of seven words that will get you out of every jam with your daughter. And here it is. That must be very hard for you, honey. <laughs> Full stop. Because, you know, we we lawyers and others, you know, who kind of solve problems for a living, we think that what our loved ones want, our daughters, our wives, our sons, uh, is please fix my problem. And what they want first and foremost is please hear my problem. And that's often the only thing that I need. So I talk about the importance of listening. And again, that's not something you're ever taught in law school. Just listen to them. You know, make sure you give them that gift. And that's often all they need. You never hear that. What you hear is, this is how you talk, and this is how you can impress them with your brilliance. It's like, well, okay, that's part of what we do, but it's not a not the place to start, in my experience. I talk about connections, how to build and maintain our connections with people, emotional intelligence, and I talk about how intellectual and linear and verbal intelligence is way out of whack in terms of its importance versus emotional intelligence in terms of what's encouraged and taught even though study after study shows that emotional intelligence is the more important one in terms of job success. Uh, I talk about how to handle stress, fear, and anxiety. I mentioned my sensitivity chapter. There's a whole chapter on sobriety, which is not just, not just alcohol and drugs, but it's workaholism. And as you said earlier, Morgan, anything that just kind of numbs you out uh, is something that you want to think about in terms of sobriety. And then the end of these chapters, uh, is putting training in its proper place because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't um, understood as saying that you need to just reject all your training and start over because there are many things that we get in our professional training that are fantastic, even in the context of building a more balanced and a more connected life. We, we learn uh, work patterns and, and we do learn to work hard and, and to plan for the future in a truly productive way and to build new habits. All those things are great. So take all the things you've learned in your professional training and use those in building towards this next phase of your life. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Thank you, Charles, for kind of laying that all out for us and, and giving us a little bit of a preview of, of the types of topics that you dive much deeper into in the book. And if y'all are here and you're listening, you're like, I just want Charles to talk more. <laughs> the good news is just get the book. <laughs> so well, you can it's, fun, it's funny you say that, Morgan. My, I mentioned my oldest daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, Diana, is um, an artist, just very creative. Um, but she was reading the book just because she loves me and wanted to read my book. And she said, Dad, this is so fantastic. So it obviously has an appeal beyond just a white collar worker, as I knew it would. These are human issues. So I knew it would have something to say to everybody. But to your point, she said, Dad, this is so great. It, it's like having you in my back pocket. Uh, so I thought, well, that's sweet. We have a wonderful relationship uh, with all three of them. But I thought that's what I was aiming for in the book, that it would feel like a conversation. It would feel like this conversation, feel like some stories. I've got some funny stories in there. Um, and, and I wanted it to feel like we were just having a, a nice mentor chat by the fireside. Yes. Yes. If you guys want this nice mentor chat in your back pocket to carry around with you, go grab a copy paperravenbooks.com slash rewiring the white collar mind. There's a link next to this video. 
you can click on that link. It'll take you straight over to Amazon. You can grab a copy of the ebook. The ebook is free today. So go ahead and do that while you're here, while you're thinking about it. If you know of anyone else, uh, maybe a colleague, maybe a friend, um, maybe a family member, maybe your own kiddo <laughs> who you would love to be able to speak, you know, these words of wisdom to them. And maybe you don't know quite how to say this to your own kiddo or niece or nephew or, or whoever, one of those young professional folks in your life. And you're like, I just want them to be happy. Well, maybe, you know, sending him a copy of Charles's book could be the thing that uh, that gets them down the trajectory of, of really seeking out uh, in a much more practical way that life balance and, and contentment. So send them this link, share this video with them, send them a copy of the book. Uh, it is Rewiring the White Collar Mind by Charles Price. There's a link next to this video. So do that while you're here, while you're thinking about it. And Charles, I guess I'm thinking of, you know, for instance, when we were a little bit younger, my husband and I were sort of thinking about his career and really where, where he wanted, of course, exactly as you said, you know, that um, bizarre sequence of logical steps where you go from, I want to be happy, I should be successful in order to be happy, therefore I should work hard to be successful, but working hard is miserable. We had this moment where he's, you know, in a New York law firm and watching the partners who don't leave the office until midnight, so sure as heck the junior associates can't leave till 2 a.m., you know, like, and we just had this conversation where it's like, what life are we building here? Like, what are we pursuing? We're looking up the ladder and not seeing a life that we really want to emulate or <laughs> become ours, <laughs> you know? And so that set us kind of down a different path. But um, if you were to speak to a younger generation who, as you said, attorneys, financial, doctor, any kind of white collar, you're in corporate or I mean, you said you're a more artistic minded daughter, you know, you want to build a career that you believe is going to set you up for a successful life. How do we, how do we even start, how do we know whether we are um, on the right track and just working hard and we're going to get there or whether we really need to pay attention to some red flags <laughs> that might be accidentally taking us into a life that's going to be really hard to have balance and contentment? Boy, those are really good questions, Morgan. And uh, I, I don't know that um, I would presume to give a, a, an answer off the cuff that would apply to everybody. What I will say is I've tried in this book to give permission to all of us individually and as professionals and as a profession to ask these questions, to say these are legitimate questions so that we're not just sleepwalking through our careers, but we're actually testing and saying, you know, is this really working for me? Is this working for my family? My law firm tells me in very specific terms what it wants from me. Sometimes my family doesn't do that as explicitly, but they still need things from me. So it's it's all about, I, I think what I would say is the more you practice um, the things that I tried to write about in the book, the more obvious some of these answers will be. The more you sort of sober up and stop numbing out and you become more connected with people and you improve your emotional intelligence, I think some of these answers become more intuitively obvious for you. And I wouldn't think that, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't want anybody else's answers to be just like mine. I wouldn't even want their questions to be exactly like mine. I just wanted to start a conversation where I said, these are the questions that I asked myself. Here's where I have ended up so far and I'm continuing to ask these questions. But I, I wanted to start a conversation in which people could develop their ability to have confidence in their own answers. And that's got to come from within you and your experience and your intuition from within yourself. It, it can't be me. I'm not a guru in that sense. This is what you should be looking for. And here's how you get there. I was like, here's the process that I went through. I hope you can find a similar process yourself. That was a perfect answer. Thank you. <laughs> because, yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think that um, even being introduced to the idea that you can both incorporate some of these uh, common practices. We've mentioned a few practical ones like listening, things like that, that will increase your ability to act as a professional, but also just benefit your relationships as a whole. So you can incorporate some of these things into your work right here, right now, you know, immediately, as well as giving yourself permission to continue to ask questions is this normal? Is this what I really want for my life? Um, and when you start to ask the questions, eventually you will hear yourself 
answering them <laughs> to yourself. And I wonder, you know, maybe that's a little bit of that intuition that we're talking about is like even just opening up that possibility of like, could I maybe not push back, maybe push back is the wrong word, but but could I just um, ask a question? Are there alternatives? Are there other ways of approaching this work um, that, again, I could be both, both successful at this work and this career and have that fulfilling life. Right. Um, what I wanted to point out in the book is that the messages that we get from our professions, from our clients, from our employers, um, tend to be very overt. They're unmistakable. This is what I want you to do. This is what success looks like. And what I point out in the book is it's, you know, the messages that we give uh, to ourselves, on behalf of ourselves, and our values, and our families, and our friends, uh, almost by definition, they are, um, they're more sort of, they're less quantifiable, a little more amorphous, and that means they're all the more important. So in an attempt to help readers make their values more explicit, and just to make this all a little more concrete, every chapter has two sections at the end, which are um, a main thought, sort of summarizing the chapter, what, what are the main points here, and something you can do today, so an action step. I've also drafted a like a 50 or 60 page workbook to go along and give um, practical steps to absorbing some of these lessons into our lives. Uh, just because I know how easy it is to just fall into this is what my profession expects me to do. Here are the steps. I know what the steps are. This is my assignment. This is what I will do. And I wanted to give something that was sort of equally concrete going the other way. It's like, hang on, let's talk about the other half of this. And let's make it equally concrete, equally doable, equally immediate, equally explicit. I love it. I love it. And you mentioned the workbook. Y'all, you get the workbook for free with the book. <laughs> So even if you go download the ebook right now, which is free today. So just a reminder to go do that paperavenbooks.com slash rewiring the white collar mind, or click the link next to this video. Um, you get the, the workbook with, with that ebook as well. You can also order a physical uh, copy of the book if you prefer, especially if you're going to give it to, to someone in your life, both of those are available right now. Um, Charles, I, I, I plan to I plan to make the uh, workbook available for free during the period that the book is available for free. At some point, I'll probably do it as a separate paid thing. But I really want to launch this thing with and and make sure it gets out to the world so that people can see that it's beneficial. So with your help and your guidance, and I've really enjoyed working with Paper Raven. Um, we're going to have a a bunch of freebies up front so that hopefully uh, get some word of mouth going. Perfect. Well, and as you said, this is just as practical, applicable, relevant to folks everyday work life as any, you know, course you would take in a grad program or a continuing learning education situation or certificate like this is the other side, as you said, this is the other side of the coin, the other part of your workday that just is as necessary for success in your career and your life. So uh, let's let's get this part of the training out too <laughs> to folks. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Charles, for being here and, and talking with us and kind of being our mentor for the moment. Any like last words for, for folks who are going to be diving into your book, Rewiring the White Collar Mind? So I'd love to hear from readers about um, uh, either things that uh, resonated with you or that you have additional questions on. I do give an email address in the book. I've been working on this book in one way or another for, for about a decade. And, and it's sort of like sending your little kid out in the world and, and you just don't know how they're going to do. Uh, so I'm, I'm very anxious to hear how people, uh, how the book resonates with people and, and hear the things that are of importance to them as they read through it. Amazing. Well, thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone. Just a reminder, go grab the ebook, click the link next to this video. It's free today. You can also order the physical version and uh, feel free to share with anyone who you think uh, might benefit from, from this conversation as well. So thank you, Charles. Thank you everyone for being here and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Bye. Morgan.